Go ahead. Yes, amen. Okay. All right. My goodness. Okay. You just need the help of God. Okay. Okay. Remember that. Amen. Um, I have some announcements. The Lighthouse, Mark Sanders Church, is in revival the 9th through the 14th. The 9th through the 14th with Jeremy Pooler. So remember that. Paula and Warren called me this evening. Their entire family is sick. They're real, real sick, have been for a few days. And it's a bronchial issue. And they, they just need our prayers. Um, I got a call from... Uh, Gail Crowley and Junior Crowley is very, very sick. They need prayers. He's down from Hartsville Way, and they need our prayers. It's a physical condition, and, and he just needs, needs the help of God. So remember that. Anybody else? Okay, remember that. Keep remembering my daughter, my granddaughter, and their family. Up in Tennessee, lost their son. Remember them. They need our prayers as well. All the sick, Crystal and them, they're, they're, uh, they need our prayers too. Pat, different ones. So, uh, Tangie. Yes, remember them. Let's stand in the house of God. Do you have unspoken? Yes, yes. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you this evening, God, that we serve a God that's mighty and a God that's awesome. And Lord, what would we do without you? Where would we turn? I pray for every need. I also pray for my brother-in-law, Harold. God, I pray for my sister, Joyce, Lord. They have physical issues and they too need our prayers. And God, we just come to you this evening knowing that all of us can look to you. It doesn't, many, doesn't matter how many needs there are, God, you're still able to meet each and every one of them. We pray for this church. We plead the blood over it, Father. We know that you can encamp angels round about it, God, and send the warrior angels to do battle over the hearts and the minds of the people, Father. Touch every individual not able to be here and minister, Lord, through your word. Touch those who have offerings and tithes to give tonight. Continue to touch Emma tonight, Lord, and her family. She's feeling better, God, but she needs our prayers. Others, God, that need, need your touch upon them, we thank you and glorify your name. We just give you praise in this house tonight. In Jesus' mighty, 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 mighty name, we pray. Amen and amen. If if you have an offering, please take it to the back pan back there. And, and Travis is, a, is going to graciously grace us with a song tonight. Come on, Travis. Stood in the courtroom, the judge turned my way. Looks like you're guilty. Now, what do you say? I spoke up, Your Honor. I have no defense. But that's when mercy walked in. Mercy walked in and pleaded my case. Called 
to the stand was God's saving grace. The blood was presented that covered my sins, forgiven when mercy walked in. Well, I stood there and wondered, how can this be? Someone so guilty had just been set free. My chains were all broken and I felt born again. The moment that mercy walked in, mercy walked in and pleaded my case called to the stand was God saving grace the blood was presented that covered my sins forgiven when mercy walked in oh the blood was presented that covered my sins forgiven when mercy walked in Appreciate that tonight. God always has somebody that can step up, doesn't he? Appreciate the Lord tonight. and Appreciate Travis. He's always willing. Never had him to say no. He better not say no. <laughs> Praise God. No. I'm just joking. Praise the Lord. Let's get right into the Word of God tonight. And I put a title on this teaching out of 1 Kings 21. That I'm not for sale. What about you tonight? Not for sale. Not for sale. Come on, say it. I'm not for sale. I'm not for sale. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let the devil know right from the beginning. Yes. We're not selling out. First Kings 21, 1 through 6. Go ahead, ladies. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by, or right next to, basically, by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spoke unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house. And I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or... If it seemed good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. He was pouting. But Jezebel his wife came to him and said unto him, why is thy spirit so sad that thou eat no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite and said unto him, Give me the vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, 
I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. Brother Wayne, would you pray? Yes, almighty God. Hide your daughter behind the cross of Calvary one more time. God, let me speak as your oracles tonight. Let me speak from the words, God, that you have placed within my spirit. Lord, touch hearts and lives, every individual that's watching. Oh, God, those are not able to be here, but let your word do the work that you sent it forth to do. And God, to let the devil know we will not sell out. We will not sell out in Jesus' name. And the church says, Amen. I'm going to read you something. I'm not saying I agree or I disagree. I'm just telling you what I found written down and I want to read it to you. Henry Ingram of Hardyville, South Carolina has vowed never to let his plantation fall into Yankee hands again, reports the Associated Press. Now this is an old, old article. He has filed deed restrictions barring the sale of his land to anyone born north of the Mason-Dixon line or to anyone whose name is Sherman or whose surname can be spelled from the letters in Sherman. Mr. Ingram is not a racial bigot. He has stipulated that any southern person, even of African descent, can buy his property at 10% discount. U.S. laws say nothing about geographical discrimination, according to a real estate lawyer, Bill McElveen. And someone would have to show that Yankees are a class of people entitled to some kind of protection. In other words, he said, if you're a Yankee, it's not for sale. Plain and simple. And that was a true article that was written many, many years ago. His land was not for sale. But our passage introduces us to another man that refused to sell out his farm. And his name was Naboth. And it, the word Naboth literally means fruit. So he was fruitful. He lived in a town or the place of Jezreel. Now Naboth owned a vineyard. And this vineyard was situated right next to the king of Samaria's land. In fact, his palace. And his name was Ahab. And scripture tells us that Ahab wanted that vineyard. He offered to trade Naboth for that vineyard. He said, if you don't want to trade it, I'll pay you cash for it. I'll give you a better one. But Naboth refuses to sell the king of Samaria his land. He knew that God had given the land to his forefathers. It had been allotted out by tribes. It had been allotted out by lots. And it was forbidden. God had forbidden Israel to sell any of the land. It was as though it was selling God's land because it belonged to God. And I want to center in on verse 3 and really preach and teach a little bit on the subject that I have titled, I'm not for sale. Now there's basically three characters that are introduced into this true story <coughs> out of the Word of God. There is Naboth, who literally represents, let's say, a Christian man. He was a godly man. He was a child of God. He was living for the Lord, and God has given all of us he had a vineyard. God has given us a vineyard. Do you know tonight that this church has a vineyard? That vineyard of souls that we are being assigned by God to go out and win so many souls from the kingdom. This church corporately has been assigned that. But so have you. Each one of you has a vineyard. It is your personal vineyard. You have the responsibility as children of God to make sure that you work your vineyard and it first begins in your own household. And then you work out from there. 
And a vineyard represents people that need to be one to the Lord. Families and loved ones and those that God has assigned for you personally. I want to stress that to win. It's not just the pastor or the preacher's duty to win souls. It is more the pastor's duty to train those under them so that they may go out and be able to win souls. Don't try to work somebody else's vineyard. Work yours. There's plenty of land for all of us. But how would it look if I come here and preach a little bit and then I go down to the First Baptist down the road down there and say, hey, I want to do this in your church and I want to do that in your vineyard? No, that's not the way it works. God has placed me here at Elgin. And until God is through with me, this is my vineyard. And the inflow of those that come here are my responsibility first and foremost. And then I also have my personal vineyard, my family, and my loved ones that it was my responsibility to work with. Y'all with me? But my responsibility first and foremost is to live the life in front of my own family. Live it in my own home so that I might get my own family saved. At least they cannot go one day and face God and say, I never saw a Christian. And he'll say, what about your mama? She lived the life in front of you. And it's our duty. We are the Bible read of all men. And if we will live the life in front of them, it will be a witness to them one day before God. If they never come in, they can never say they did not know the way that a Christian should live. But even Jesus said, start at Jerusalem and then work out. So it's important tonight to know what your vineyard is and where your vineyard is. And this is where you work at. It's not, I mean, it just, you wouldn't come here and take membership in this church and do all your work down the road at another church. It'd be the same as me going to Hardy's and ordering me a chicken biscuit or whatever. And when I get ready, they hand it to me and they got, get ready. Well, I'm going to go over here to McDonald's or over to Burger King or one of these other places. I'll pay for it over there. You don't do that. You understand? If this is your place that God has placed you, this is your vineyard, uh, a rolling stone gathers no moss, so put all of your efforts into where God has placed you to be at. So Naboth represents the child of God, the Christian, the godly man. The second person in this story is Ahab. And most would say he's the devil. Now, he was influenced by the devil. That's for sure. But he really represents the outright sinner and possibly could represent the backslider who is turned away from God. And we know that at one time, he really came from a godly lineage. A lot of people don't know that. For we do know that at one time he came out of a people who crossed the Red Sea. They were his relatives. And he was king of Israel. His father was Omri, O-M-R-E. And the lineage that they came from was a godly lineage way back yonder. But we've got people right in our own families, sitting in our own churches that have come from godly lineages. But that does not necessarily mean that they're going to pick up and always live for God. There are some who turns away from God and just makes up their mind, I will have nothing to do with it. I don't want God. I don't want your heaven. I don't want any of it. I want to live the way I want to live. But, it, but it, still they came from a godly lineage. Okay? But he, Ahab, was really part of Jewish history. And like I said, his lineage came, if you go back, which I don't have time to go into it tonight, it came from a people who saw the miracles of God performed, saw the Red Sea opened up, 
saw the cloud by day and the fire by night and all of these miracles in the wilderness take place, but yet he turned his back on God. And I'm sure that throughout that lineage and throughout history, from generation to generation, the stories were told about what happened to Israel and how God helped them. But Ahab sold out his heritage. And one way he did it was when he ended up marrying somebody he should never have married. Be careful. I wish the young people were here tonight. But if you're young and you're listening out there tonight, be careful who you choose as a husband or a wife. Don't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. It will pull you down. It will cause problems in your home. Some of them will go on for generations because of it. But Ahab married somebody he should never have married, a Gentile, a pagan priestess, an idol worshiper, he went against everything God said and he represents that sinner or possibly that backslider for the sake of this message tonight and the way that I'm trying to bring it out. And lastly, there was Jezebel. Now she's the one who really represents the devil. Not because... Now, now, not all women are devils. Don't get me wrong. This is not gender related. But to be called a Jezebel is not a good compliment. I haven't seen many parents having little baby girls and naming them Jezebel. Have y'all? It's just not done. And Ahab sold out his lineage and married Jezebel against the commandment of God. He went across the bloodline and it opened the door for Satan to be able to attack him even greater. And if we do that, it opens the door for Satan to come into that home and attack that home and the, the children that might be born and it goes on and on and on. Simply because we did not choose wisely who we marry. But most of us are young when we get married. We, we don't have sense enough to follow God's guidelines. And we pay in the end for it. But Jezebel, a pagan priestess, in, she brought in to Samaria, into the kingdom, she brought idol worship there. So then the, it began to turn the nation away from God unto idol worship. And the Bible said that Ahab did evil in the sight of God. And now Ahab was a weak man. He was not a strong man. And he began to be controlled by his wife who represents the devil because the devil worked through her. And she was literally considered one of, if not, the most wicked woman that was ever listed in the Bible. If she wasn't the most, she was right up there with them. So Ahab sees this vineyard that Naboth has. And, and Naboth is who is the child of God. And Ahab the sinner wants what God's child has got. He wants his vineyard. Do you know the devil wants your vineyard tonight? He's not sitting, sitting idly by while you plow and you plant and you give the word of God and you pray and, and all the things that you're doing over that vineyard. He's not going to sit there idly by and let you get by with that. He wants that vineyard as his own. And it was right next to a palace that he had. He didn't really need it. He was the king over, was it eight, ten of the tribes? I can't well remember right offhand. But he owned most of, of that whole nation there. He didn't need Naboth's vineyard. He could have had any land. He was the king, you see. But he wanted what the, the child of God had. He wanted to take it from him. Why? Because it was a matter of power and control and greed. The devil always wants to destroy God's people and what his people have. 
So he goes to Naboth, just like the devil tempted Jesus, he begins to tempt Naboth. Three times Satan tempted Jesus. He thought he could make him do things. He ought to know better than that. But it, when he was in the wilderness, when he was hungry after fasting 40 days, he was hungry. So the devil comes to him after that fasting. And he begins to tempt him. And, and he says, why don't you go ahead and turn these stones into bread? I know you're hungry, but if you be the son of God, I'm, I'm ad-libbing in here, but if you be the son of God, surely you can turn this into bread so you'll have something to eat. And you know what Jesus said? But Now, he didn't use these words, but by his actions, he said, not for sale. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then Satan goes to Jesus and takes him up on this high mountain, and he said, why don't you just jump off? I read one time where the angels, if you even just just hit your feet, do you know I'm like I say, I'm just ad libbing in here, but this is a whole thought of it. It's in the word of God that the angels will catch you. You won't get hurt. And Jesus again basically says, Not for sale. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And the third time, he brought him up to the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, look, if you'll bow down to me and give your life to me, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. And isn't that funny? The devil tried to take something from Jesus. Jesus created the world. He created all the nations. And again, Jesus looks at him and basically said, not for sale, devil. Thou shall not have any other gods before you. So he uses the word against the enemy. Three different temptations. He said he tempted him to do something that would make him feel good, his physical body, it would cure the hunger, and something that would question God's love, and something that would cause him to take over the throne. So what it was, he tempted him physically, spiritually, and he's tempted him in his soulish area. And we all get tempted there. We all go through temptation. So Jesus, like the, Jesus, just like the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, Ahab represents the one who tempts us. And he comes to Naboth. And he said, I'll give you money for it. Boy, he better not ask that today, had he? People sell out anything for a dollar bill. Then he said, I'll give you another vineyard. I'll give you a better one. He wants to take you away from that that God has issued for you to take care of, for you to try to win to him, for you to witness to. He said, you don't need that vineyard. Go over here. Go down to the third Baptist church down there. Is there a third? They got a first. It got to be a second, a third somewhere, don't they? But, and I'm not making fun of the Baptist church. Believe me, I'm not. They're good people. They win a lot of souls to the Lord. But it's not my duty to push me out of here and go to another church. And basically, that'd be the thing that he, he would be doing. Okay? But he would say, why don't you trade it? The devil would say, give me your talent. I'll give you some better uh, places to, to use it at. Go down here to the honky-tonk. You can use that musical ability. Travis, down the honky-tonks. You know, I'll give you better. I'll pay you money. You'll do a lot better down there. But there's nothing better than Jesus. And like Naboth, you better say not for sale. Okay? Let me see. Ahab pouted. I can see him. God has said he laid down. You got to go read. He laid on that bed. He couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't do anything. And old Jezebel comes in. I said, what in the world's wrong with you? Why ain't you eating? Sat in our palace. Well, there's this uh, vineyard and it's right next to my palace. And, and I asked Naboth to sell it to me. And Naboth won't sell it to me. What am I going to do, Jezzy? You know. And she said, honey, don't you worry one bit. I'll take care of that thing. And she did. 
She did. She wrote up letters and signed the king's name to it and used the king's seal and she plotted how to get that vineyard. And when she did, she called a special, um, it wasn't a feast because actually they fasted. She called a fast. And when you read the history of the thing, you find out that something major had taken place or was about to take place in Israel, and it was going, it was bad. It was really bad, and she needed somebody to blame it on. So she hired two scoundrels, two men, to lie on Naboth. And she called Naboth to this gathering. And when they gathered together, all of a sudden these two scoundrels rose up and said, Naboth has blasphemed God and he's blasphemed the king. And it ended up getting him stoned to death. And when you read the, what was really taking place, they was blaming the condition that was going on in Israel at the time on Naboth as though his sinning against the king and against God caused this catastrophe in Israel. Do you see what she did? She comes back. She takes that, that uh, let's just say the deed to her husband and basically said, get up off that bed. Go plant your vineyard. That's what you wanted. You got it. But do you know what made it so bad? When you read 2 Kings 9 and 26, it indicates it was even worse than just Naboth. It said the blood of Naboth's sons as well. Do you know that she had not only Naboth, but the entire family destroyed, had them murdered, so none of his children could stand up later and claim the vineyard back. She not only killed Naboth, she wiped out his entire family because of greed. Can you think that anybody would do that? And yet she did. And when he died, she, I told you, she told her husband, said, rise up, take possession of it before Naboth is dead. And he took that vineyard and he grew herbs in that vineyard. And they got both of them. They got what they wanted but they paid a price in the end. God sent the prophet to them. And I'm going to tell you something. You do not scheme. And you do not plot to take something else for your own greed that, that somebody else, God's children, ought to have. God said it, and he said, some of this I'm going to leave out, but it cost them in the end, and it will cost you if you do that. Sometimes what happened here was that Jezebel, the prophecy was given, the dogs are going to lick your blood up. And they threw her out of a window, and her blood was licked up by the dogs. But if you read on, Ahab repented for a short season. A short season. But then... Because of what he did, it went down to his next generation. And do you know that his, after Ahab died, that his son became king? And when his son was killed in a battle, that the soldiers took his body? And do you know where they throwed his body? Onto the vineyard that had one time belonged to Naboth. And there the dogs no doubt licked up his blood. I'm going to tell you, you don't get by with anything from God. You just don't do it, people. I'm telling you, you don't. Let me see, how much of this do I want to bring out? But anyway, Naboth had said, it's not for sale. No doubt, like some of you, you have remembered the effort that you put into your vineyard. You know the prayers that you have prayed. You know how you've laid hands on them. You've anointed them. You've, you've called them yours and, and said you belong to God and, and devil you're not touching. You know what you've gone through with them. And Naboth probably remembered the dedication of his forefathers in that vineyard. 
And he told that king, he said, I'm not selling out my heritage, not something that my forefathers have worked so hard to maintain, and you want me to sell it to you? And basically, he said to him, my relationship with my God means more to me than that. I'll not go against his word and sell out my inheritance. And he wasn't just talking about the what he was growing there. He was talking about the land that belonged to God, the vineyard itself, children of God. What our forefathers have fought for for us. Think of our mothers and our fathers and, and the church people before us. How they stood up and battled the devil. How they fought. Even this church right here, the forefathers. And we would dare to sell out. Honey, we're not for sale. This church is not for sale. I don't care how much money they offer. I don't care what the devil tries to bring in. Our inheritance, our heritage is not for sale. Do you hear me? The baptism of the Holy Ghost is not for sale. Our prayer life is not for sale. The works of the Spirit of God are not for sale. We belong to an almighty God. He died for us. It's his church. It's not our church. And we're not about to sell out the heritage of this church. Our forefathers obtained it through their fasting and their praying, Sister Diane, through spiritual warfare, through a holy living and a holy life. And we've got to determine in our hearts that no matter what the devil offers us, we're going to tell the devil, devil, we're not for sale. Look that devil in the eye and say, I'm not for sale. Give him a hand clap. <laughs> Listen, I come from a long line of preachers. Some of you come from a long line of people that serve God and ministers and so on. My mom and my dad were preachers. Generations back, they were preachers, right, Richard? They drew up their personal papers. We've got We've got documents where they grew up, drew up their personal deeds and papers. And they would first start out by extolling the virtues of God. Telling what God had done for them and what God had given them. And they wrote it down on paper. We got history that goes back to the 1700s where one of our lineage was a Baptist preacher and had been preaching for 40 solid years. My mama and my daddy brought out six preachers preaching right now. Six of them. Others are preachers' wives or, or, or else they're music leaders or just, you know, they come in and workers in the church. But that's my heritage. And my mom took all 15 of her children to church. And I saw them as they shouted all over the place in that holiness church, that Pentecostal church. I was saved, y'all know that, eight, nine years old, under my own mother's preaching. My lineage is full of those who serve God. And the devil wants to destroy me and my family and my heritage. I'm not for sale. My heritage is not for sale. And this church is not for sale. Holy God, holy God. Do you know and do you realize that your heritage also includes your children, your kids? your grandchildren, your spouse. He's after the internal sanctity of your home, children. The Christian home is under attack tonight. Homes are under attack. Our children are under attack. And folk are selling out for just a little bit of pleasure. Parents, we sell out our kids when we don't bring them to the house of God. A lot of people don't realize that. Your kids deserve a Christian mom and a Christian dad. 
And we sell out our kids when we let them watch things on TV that are vulgar and they're not fit to watch. And we let them listen to the filthy lyrics of this worldly music. And they, their principles are gone. They, they do things they shouldn't do. And we don't check behind what they're doing. And we're selling them out. And they'll tell you, that's my space. You don't touch it. But honey, if it's in your home and they're under your roof, it is absolutely your duty to check behind them. My Lord, we're not going to sell out our homes to the devil. Listen, the influence it, we have to have over our kids is so important and so vital that whatever we do, every decision we make, we need to pray over that thing and make sure of what God wants us to do. Will the kids rebel against it? Yes, they will. But you do it anyway. I'm not selling out my vineyard. I worked too hard to get it. I sowed for many a year. I'd get up and I'd say, all of my children are taught of the Lord. Great is a piece of my children. And I did that when they were still living in sin. I said, I don't care, devil. I'm telling you, all of my children are taught of the Lord. Great is a piece of my children. I did that for years until I brought it into place. I pulled it out of this natural realm down through the spirit realm and now they're taught of the Lord and great is a piece of my children. Was it easy? No, it wasn't. I was fought every step of the way. But I tell you, it's worth it. <laughs> Woo! Let me see where we're at in this. Naboth said, it's not for sale. And God honored his obedience even unto death. And do you know something else is not for sale? My heart is not for sale. What about you tonight? Even though the devil got a hold of maybe some of your vineyard, through all of your praying, they get a hold of it illegally. He can't get your heart, Brother Richard. It's not for sale. And God honored his obedience because after they killed Naboth, God sent a prophet to Ahab and Jezebel both. And because, he said, because you did this, I've done talked about this, both of you are going to die and the dogs are going to lick up your blood. But why does God take special interest in our hearts. Think about it. Do you realize that when Jesus was on this earth, that he ministered for three and a half years, that he never owned anything? Do y'all know that? Everything he had was borrowed. He borrowed a body that he could be born in, the body of a virgin. He, he borrowed a robe of flesh that he could wear while he lived in this world. He borrowed a boat one time and pushed it out into the lake or the sea or wherever it was at. And he preached to the people on the seashore so it would be just like his microphone right here. And it would be able to carry and they'd hear him. And he borrowed a scroll one time when he was 12 years old and he went into the temple. He began to teach the, the scribes while they were in that temple. He borrowed a, a fish and, and uh, five fish and a, what, two barley loaves? Or, or was it two fish and five? Whatever it was. But anyway, he borrowed them and he fed 5,000 along with the women and the children. He borrowed a ball of mud one time from the ground. He made a, a man to be able to see when he put it on his eyes. He borrowed a child and set him on his lap in the midst of him and taught the disciples that if you don't get as tender as these little old children are, you're never going to enter the kingdom. He borrowed a back one time when his cross was too heavy. He was carrying it up Golgotha's hill. He borrowed a burial place one time that he could a tomb that belonged to Joseph of Aaron. Arimathea. And if you could picture that and hear their conversation, it might go something like this. Now, jo Joseph, my friend, I'm only going to need it for three days. You can have it back after that. I'm just going to borrow it for the weekend. My Lord God. But the only, he, only one thing I know that he ever bought. One thing I know Jesus ever bought. That was my heart and your heart. When he paid the price for our salvation. 
He bought our salvation. He paid our sin debt. Thank God for the blood of Calvary and the redemption that he made for you and I. And because of that, we can go to heaven and live with him. And when the devil comes to you and says, give me your heart, you can say to him, listen, I didn't pay for my heart. It, I don't own it, so it's not for sale. It belongs to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, not for sale. Stand all over the house. The only way you can get it is to sign over your rights legally yourself and give it willingly to the devil. That's the only way he can give it is for you to give it to him. And I'm not giving him a thing. I'm not going to do it, Sister Roby. I didn't come too far. I'm not for sale and neither is my heart. You can make it through any situation, any tragedy when you're not for sale. They might take my life. They might take my breath. But they can't take my heart. It belongs to Jesus. Do you know that Ahab pouted and Jezebel plotted and Naboth perished? But God prevailed. Amen. Think about that. Amen. Let me ask you tonight. Are you determined within your heart to say, Devil, I'm not for sale. My home is not for sale. My heart is not for sale. My life is not for sale. Sinner friend, I wonder, somebody out there listening tonight, by live streaming, are you willing to say I'm not for sale? Maybe there's somebody out there listening and you've been sailing out to the enemy. Maybe there's somebody you've gone so far in sin and you know that God's been dealing with you and wooing you and wooing you and still you've not turned your heart over to God but there's something on the inside that you know how lonely you are. You know how hurting you are. You know that you need to get right with God but you have not been willing to do it yet. The devil's told you you've gone too far. You can't go any far. But let me tell you what. There's nothing you have done that if you want to, to repent and you're willing to repent and turn around and give your life to God, God will wipe your slate clean. He'll never remember it ever again in your life if you're willing to do that. But you've got to ask him. You've got to do it. Let's pray. Almighty God, I don't know who's been listening by live streaming tonight. I see those that are here. And God, we're determined in our heart not to sell out. We're not for sale. I realize there's many a test and many a trial coming our way. And we've we got to face some things. But God, by your strength and your help, we'll make it through. We're not selling out to the devil. And Father, if there's somebody out there, if there is a sinner that's listening, I beg you, I plead with you, get down on your knees, call out to God, ask Him to forgive you of your sins. He'll wash it all away if you'll just repent and turn away from that thing and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll do it. Tell that devil I'm not for sale. I no more will I sell out to the devil. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. Thank you.